All yours. Thank you very much and welcome back everyone who's uh, joining us by live stream this morning. Uh, we're about to start uh, item 13, which is the short-term financing options for growing social housing. Uh, we have two councillors that are on the uh, board of the Ototahi Community Housing Trust, and so of course they are not able to participate uh, in the discussion or the decision, and uh, so I'll be handing over to um, uh, Bruce Rendell, I believe, uh, Head of Facilities, uh, who will be taking us through the paper. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, so the paper presents a proposal whereby Council uses uh, funding from central government to build new social housing. Uh, council itself is not eligible for that funding, um, but the Otatahi Community Housing Trust is. Um, Otatahi has proposals and projects ready to go on and the land to um, undertake the work. Unfortunately, they're not in a position to finance the, uh, the projects, and that's where council can step in to assist um, and that would work on the basis of council borrowing money and then on lending that to Otatahi. Um, Otatahi would then pay back over the life of the contracts they have with government and the costs um, that they and the pay repayments will meet all of council's costs um, and deliver a, uh, a proposal that has at no cost to uh, ratepayers. Probably the key decision you have today is the decision on whether or not to borrow, and you are facing uh, some significant financial pressures. I believe that uh, the finance team has circulated uh, a uh, information earlier this week um, with details of uh, the borrowing headroom that you've got and the ability whether or not we can can do this. From the point of view of looking at with a housing hat on, this proposal helps uh, increase the numbers of units and helps uh, rebuild our stock to pre-earthquake levels. It helps meet current demand. Uh, there is an existing waiting list within Christchurch um, and it's possible that current circumstances means that that waiting list may increase. Uh, it produces a no-cost to ratepayers solution. Um, and also get some, uh, some jobs happening. Um, for those who might have been expecting to see um, public housing um, and social housing in some of our capital bids for the government, um, we understand from the government that there are separate streams for social housing, which is what we are working to include this in, uh, and that's why it hasn't gone through the, uh, the Infra Infrastructure Commission process as well. So I'll stop there and uh, ready to answer any questions that might come my way. Well, I think it would be helpful to get the um, to get the finance team to speak to the to the headroom issue because I know that that's where uh, councillors uh, were expressing um, concern and that's uh, perfectly justifiable. So if the whoever's speaking for the finance team, that would be great. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good morning, councillors. It's uh, Carol, um, Carol and Lena here. Um, Carol, would you like to me to speak to this, or would you like to? Speak I didn't to think Carol? you were Carol. <laughs> yes, Len. I think your sound quality might be better than mine. So, if you could proceed, thank you. That's fine now, Carol. You're perfect. Oh, okay. All right, um, so perhaps I'll make some opening comments and then invite um, Len to join in. Um, the issue we have is around the amount of debt headroom that we have and you'll recall that when we were doing our long-term plan we talked about that peaking in 2024 and the headroom is what, for our debt is what enables us to, if there are future um, events like earthquakes, to be able to respond and you'll know that as a council we must cover the first 40% of the costs of any event so that, that the um, central government will then cover the remaining 60%. So our current debt levels um, with the peak at 2024 result in 200 million of headroom. With the current COVID pressures and um, desire to be reducing rates, that's put much further pressure 
on the debt headroom. And then in addition to that, there's the possibility that CCHL may want to borrow direct rather than going through us. So with all of those factors in, we could be looking at a debt, room, debt headroom of only 90 million. Now this request for a further 25 million for the council housing project would leave us with only 65 million for the next five years and from a financial prudency point of view I do have significant concerns around that. Leon, is there anything further you wanted to add? Yeah, the, um, we've been working with the facilities team um, for near on six to nine months on these proposals. Um, whereby when we looked at all of the um, priorities at that point in time, obviously COVID-19 had not um, occurred. So therefore, we need to, need to be sh relatively sure that what priorities we have to social housing is either on that list or not on that list. And then it becomes a simple, yes, it is on that list, and yes, it is a mechanism to get um, people back into jobs if that's what it, it ends up being. The question is that in 2024, we're assuming the stadium will go ahead, which is the biggest um, impact on our debt he ceiling levels. If that gets shifted either front, forward or backwards, that headroom changes over time. The, this, this 25 million is anticipated to be out there for at, at least 20 years. Um, the agreement with the um, with the Crown for Otatahi is basically up to 25 years, I believe, and so therefore they'll be paying that back as they receive their um, the rental subsidies and, and the work and the money from from that over time. So yes, we will be um, um, hitting that headroom. Yes, 65 million is likely to be all we will have. And so therefore it means that if there are any other shocks, we will we be able to meet our obligations. I just wonder if the decision that we're confronted with here today is quite that stark. Do we prioritise social housing um, over other things? My question is, is do we unlock central government funding that is available for social housing and isn't available through any other means? So um, we, we probably would have included social housing in the Crown Infrastructure Partners bid or request for proposals um, if we weren't uh, looking at, um, at other options that were available for social housing. I mean, Crown Infrastructure Partners made it pretty clear that they're interested in unlocking residential subdivisions that are locked up for some reason. Uh, even if they're private sector ones, if there's a public benefit. But I didn't get that sense in relation to social housing that we were opening up that area. So I just wonder if the choice really is that stark. And I'm not sure, Dawn, did you want to um, leap in? Because in a way, we're going to get housing advice and we're going to get um, uh, finance advice, but we don't unlock any central government funding ourselves. We can't, and the only way that we unlock it for housing um, is through um, uh, through the um, Altatahi community housing. Thank you, Mayor. So um, I think the advice that Carol has given is the factual position at the point in time, and I think you, you need to be aware of that. This, for me, you're absolutely right in the sense that this is unlocking government funding that we cannot access ourselves, and it doesn't put uh, uh, pressure on the rates. I hope you're hearing me okay. Um, the, the fundamental then becomes, as we move into the annual plan and the LTP, is genuinely looking at what is in our headroom and exactly what it is that the council wishes to invest in going forward. So knowing if you were making this decision today, you had locked up a percentage of your capital and your headroom borrowing, and we would need to be looking, how do we ensure we protect our 40% position in case of other incidences and uh, con you know, things hitting the city? We would need to take that into consideration. So it's being fully aware of that position. But you will have choices going forward as a council as we look at our capital programme. <coughs> But in terms of the risk and resilience question that we've set really as the overarching framework for our LTP, 
we're actually looking at whether we've um, what we what risk we transfer, what risk we hold, and what risk we can mitigate. And of course, our infrastructure is in a much better position um, today than it was prior to the 2010 earthquake that started the sequence um, and then uh, carried through on in, in, on February 22nd. So the following year. So I think we're in a slightly different position, well, significantly different position than we were in back then. That is true, but we still need to be just aware of the situation. No, 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 and I'm, I'm not yeah. objecting to the awareness. Now, I've got lots of questions. So I've got Jimmy, Pauline, Sam, Sarah, Mike, Aaron, um, Andrew, Melanie. So um, <laughs> let's work through those. Jimmy Chen. Okay, yeah, two questions. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first one regarding to the, uh, the two point D. Star particularly mentioned the two million dollars out of twenty five million dollars for developing plan plan and the funding application for further fifty four units. So my question is uh, so where is the funding come from for the further construction release of fifty four unit is from the future council long term plan or try to seek in some other source of the funders? That's the first question. So, so I can answer that. So um, and what we're working towards uh, is funds that are existing in places that are existing in the government's current budget, um, and those would be the ones that we would seek to build now. We've also got strong indications from MHUD that there are additional places uh, coming up in the next budget. Um, we wanted to be ready to be able to um, proceed to uh, access those as well. Um, so there's about 130 places for Christchurch that uh, could be got in the current budget and potentially another 100 to 130 in next year's budget uh, as well. So that's where that funding source would be. Okay, thank you. Second question is uh, paragraph 4.1. So, and uh, what's the time frame that the target for the social housing, uh, the those the, uh, kind of unit, the uh, the, the members the will be the de decided, the numbers will be decided, because at the moment based on the staff you mentioned, uh, we establish uh, the social housing strategy. You now we are establish estimate those the numbers. When? 4.1. So, so if, if um, sorry, partly cut out there, Councillor Chen, but if I get this right, uh, you're looking to know when we would establish a target through the yes. social housing strategy. Yes, um, yes. That, that needs to come back to uh, the Council. Um, if you remember, we did have a preliminary briefing on it um, before the COVID-19 lockdown and yes. there was a request for a workshop um, to be held with councillors to explore the matters in more depth. Um, that, because of the circumstances, has not been able to be uh, had yet um, and is still required um, before we can um, complete the documentation and then bring it forward to council for approval for consultation. Um, so I can't give you a time frame yet because of the uncertainty associated with the COVID-19 situation, okay, um, yes. but as soon as we can get that certainty, we'll pass that on to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Pauline Cotter. Thank you. I just want to um, how much these units are per unit. Do you know? I guess there'll be a mixture of one or two bedrooms, so then the um, bedrooms. That's not very clear, Pauline. Sorry, I'm going to intervene. Um, I can't understand what you're saying. You're, you're breaking up a bit. Do you want to switch your video off for a minute and ask your question again? Yep. Is that better? Is that better? Not much. How about, Try again. Try again. How about if I email my question through? You at all now. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, we'll, we'll email them through to the group list and we'll get them. Yeah, uh, I'll do that. You. Okay, sure. thank you. Uh, Sam McDonald. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Bruce. Probably a follow on from Jimmy uh, in terms of the funding. So, we're obviously there's a provision in the recommendation for the design work for a next phase, and I appreciate the government will fund 
um, your auditors are funding round. Did you mean that they would fund them fully, or would it be the same arrangement as what we would be agreeing to today? So I guess the the, the point I'm making is we would uh, you know potentially loan 25 mil today. Are they going to come back in a year's time and ask for more when our headroom is is relatively tight? So can you just talk me through that? Yeah. Um, so. Um, where we want to head to through the long-term planning process is put in front of you the option uh, for having a consistent um, ability to take advantage of these government opportunities um, into the future. So uh, yes, there is that potential that through the long-term plan um, there will be a request that you'll have to consider and make a decision on um, about having an ongoing uh, borrowing stream to be able to um, uh, meet the targets or any target that you might choose to set through the social housing strategy. Um, but that does not necessarily mean it's a cumulative um, adding on of 30 million plus 25 plus 25 plus 25 for instance. Um, one of the proposals that we're looking to develop is that it's a standing amount that can be borrowed up to, and as repayments are made, um, the facility is there that um, that it can be further drawn down for new development. So that's certainly one option that is being worked on, but no decisions have been made, and we'll have to come back to council before we we do any, uh, before you make any decisions on that. Uh, there are other options that we're exploring, but they're in early days and not uh, appropriate for discussion. Uh, at this stage as well, um, but those also would look to see if we can get the borrowing away from council um, and to other other parties. So hopefully yeah. that answers your question. Yeah, it does. It makes a wee bit more comfort. Um, the second one was around, um, and I think you may have answered in that you're doing work on it at the moment, but can you just, I guess, confirm that for me? There's, there's a lot of, uh, or there are properties within the council portfolio which are currently not used, and I just look at and not necessarily being an answer of borrowing more, um, but actually disposing of or transferring them to the trust. Can you just, uh, I guess, even confirm for me that you're looking at doing that to try and, I guess, not look at just one option of borrowing more, but use the balance sheet we've got um, and, and underutilised assets? Yeah, uh, a absolutely. So we are looking at, um, particularly in the housing portfolio, the potential disposal of um, properties where it's not economically feasible to um, get them up to today's standards. Um, and then, but rather than necessarily using that, uh, the return from that, um, one of the considerations, and again, it will all be subject to council decisions rather than um, just coming back from my office. Uh, I can say it's just that the use the Sorry, Bruce, you have been a Dalek now. Bruce, I'm sorry, really sorry, but you're... Yeah. Cutting out. No, that's no good. No good. Definitely a Dalek. Yeah, sorry. Um, we're going to have to find a way of um, getting him back online because people have got substantial questions. Um, can you back out, um, Bruce, and dial back in? I can't. Yeah. Okay. I'm assume assume that he's gone now. Um, did anyone have? I've got Aaron, Andrew, Melanie. I've got Pauline, but Pauline's questions um, need to be answered by Bruce. Has anyone got any of the finance questions or questions of Dawn that could be answered in the meantime? Aaron, Andrew, Melanie, or Pauline, or should we? Um, I mean, sorry, Pauline. I can see Aaron, Andrew, and Melanie. Is there anyone yes. that had a finance question? Yes. It's Melanie. Who's it? Oh, Melanie. Far away. Um, great. Um, I was just wanting to um, understand the um, debt revenue ratios because they're often expressed um, as percentages. And just could we have explained like what their maximum sort of percentage is, how that gets decided, and if there's any um, potential changes? Because I think I've heard something about that discussed. So could that be answered? Sure. Um, Melanie, this is Carol here. I'll just check that everyone can hear me. Yes, we can. Yep. That's fine. Great. So the um, the limit on our net debt revenue ratio is 250%. 
So when I was speaking earlier, I talked about um, the different levels that we got to, and I was talking about um, the peak at 228% in 2024 as a result of the multi-use arena, and that was all before any pre-COVID impacts. Um, when I was looking at having 90 million left, that was looking at sitting at about 240%. Now you'll recall that for those who were here when we did the last annual, uh, last long-term plan, we had a lot of debate around how high we were comfortable in letting those levels go. And at the time we talked around 220, 225 being our kind of absolute top limit. And we did end up going just slightly above that at the 228. So um, sitting at that 240% or higher just really is not a financially prudent position to be in. So um, how does that 250% get set? Because I think some councils go over that amount as far as I can tell. And um, is there any murmurings about that changing? Or like, yeah, can you explain about where the 250 comes from? So the limit is the limit that is set in our um, financial strategy, which is a um, document we agree as part of the long-term plan. It is also based on our local government funding agency um, covenants that we have as well. And so we can't right. access local government funding agency funds if we're above that limit. Great. Okay, thanks for that, Carol. That was very helpful. Thanks very much for the both the question and, and the response. Thank you. Um, Dan, I'm back online now. That's great. Uh, look, I'm going to ask you um, the two questions that came through from Pauline, and then we're heading back to. I um, oh know actually Pauline's after. No, she he, she was before Sam. So I'll just I'll just go. How long will it take for the 85 units to be built? And uh, the other question does seem to assume something that I don't think is correct, which is, will there be income to council once they're built, assuming they'll be leased to the trust? Um, but my answer is, my my view, recollection is that, that, it, that from the paper is that it's OCHT that will own them, um, but it is the return on our on our loan that we will that will will generate. Um, It'll generate a return, won't it? It won't just be there. But anyway, how long will the 85 units take to build and will there be income to council once they're built? Yeah, so in terms of the first, um, the um, the worst case is an 18 month to completion, but we uh, expect that most of those would be uh, completed in 12 months based on where we are with the planning cycles um, and the funding cycles. Um, and so that would add to um, those that are currently um, complete or um, under, uh, under, constru under construction at the moment. In terms of the return to council, um, the report um, presupposes that uh, they are owned by the trust so that council gets back the loan plus any costs that it um, uh, requires or is um, um, faces, but the trust will, and they would then be looking to reinvest that uh, any surplus they get in the maintenance um, uh, and upgrade of units, building new units, and also providing services to tenants. So we'd still get the same outcome, uh, but it just would not be delivered by council; would be delivered by our strategic community partner, Otatahi Community Housing Trust. That's great. Look, thank you. And uh, we'll go back to Sam McDonald. Would you like to ask your question again? No, you've turned into a Dalek. Where are you? I oh, can't see you. Yeah. Oh, no, mine oh, have, I'm better. fine. Yeah, I might have been asked and answered. So. You're all good? Okay. Yep. Um, Aaron Kewan. Hello. Yeah. Oh yeah, great. I'm coming coming through. Um, so I've got uh, two two questions. Um, so I'm not sure who wants to answer them. But the first one is the um, uh, around our debt ceiling and our limit that 
it, it leaves us with a very narrow window, like you say, the 65 million. Um, if something else comes up in the next few years, which um, puts us to the wall again, and we don't know the outcome of COVID fully yet, um, or the recovery coming out of this, how long the tail's going to be, so on and so forth. There's a lot of uh, crystal ball going on. Um, if we uh, do this and end up in that um, position of the 65 million, do we have the option later on, if something else comes up in Christchurch that we need to um, be able to extend our borrowing, that we can then sell the trust to recoup the money? Or can we sell that debt? I mean, is there a way around this? Yeah. Uh, is there so I can answer in terms of I can answer in terms of selling the trust, and no, because we don't own the trust. They are a separate, independent um, organisation. So uh, we're not in a position there. But I'd leave it to my finance colleagues to talk about the probably more like more um, likely option of selling that debt. Yeah, is that an option? It's, uh, it's Len here. Um, one of the things that Bruce alluded to earlier was that we have considered a number of funding options for social housing um, using um, internal CCOs, uh, crown controlled organisations and other options, um, including private sector investment. All of these items are still on the table. So therefore, there might be options um, whether or not um, the ultimate um, cost of these delivery may be within another entity, but delivering the outcomes we want through OCH team. Okay. Um, so then my other question, which is around the debt as well, um, when uh, I heard, and I don't know the full story, so it's only, you know, it's potentially grasping at straws, but always worth a go. Um, when Minister Robertson, uh, because of COVID the other week, announced um, businesses being able to take on loans and the government would guarantee them or underwrite them, uh, d d is the trust able to do that? Um, use a government guarantee rather than a council one because of what was said or not? Yeah. Just, but, um, I don't know... Hmm. Yeah, I don't know the specifics of that, but the key, um, one of the key factors um, that impacts the trust's ability to borrow is that when council capitalised the trust, um, we set them up with a $5 million gift and then a $45 million loan of um, properties um, and, and buildings. And the reason for that was that the council wanted the ability in certain circumstances to recover the assets. Um, and those kind of circumstances are if the trust was to become insolvent, uh, in situations like that. And under the charitable trust legislation, they can't um, transfer those assets back to council if we've completely gifted them. So that requires um, the trust to um, come back to council in a simple in a simple fashion. It requires trust to come back to council every time they wish to borrow. Um, but what we've already seen from looking at that is that commercial banks want the trust to give first priority um, over assets, and we've actually seen also over revenue streams to the commercial banks. And that's not just over the new assets that are being constructed but over the existing council assets that the trust controls. And that's a situation that is uh, completely unacceptable. We could face the risk of not getting any income at all from uh, the portfolio. So that restriction is probably the biggest and hardest one that the trust faces for, uh, for loans. Um, so we, if, even if the government guarantee applied, would need to see does it work with the specific arrangements that occur over that $45 million um, uh, loan arrangement we already have in place with them. Okay. Um, and then finally, um, Bruce, uh, because I'm a, um, a square meterage guy, the $25 million, how many units does that buy? Does, is, well, it's not just 85, is it? Like, where does all the money go? So um, this 
the 25 it consists of covering the 85 plus, I think, um, from the report, uh, 2 million for design for the next lot of uh, for units as well. So um, I think that in terms of the costings that we're seeing um, that the trust has got for its current lot of projects, that they have been uh, reasonable um, in the sense of where we know that other costings are for um, what we've built ourselves. Um, and they're around about, I'm just going off the top of my head, uh, back of my memory here, about 220,000 uh, per unit, uh, per one bedroom unit. Um, we'd like to still try and move and drop that further if we can. Um, so there's constant work being done to see if we can take cost out. Um, but at the same time, we're also working to try and uh, <coughs> increase the standard uh, given broader community concerns about uh, the standard of social housing um, that you might see from time to time in the media. Right, yeah, so if the two millions um, for planning for the others, that leaves 23 million, so that's now 270 uh, per unit for the 85. Um, I take it uh, that they're a passive building at that cost. Uh, there's certainly Green Star 6. Um, They've, because um, we don't just concentrate on the environmental aspects, there's also we build to life mark equivalency. Um, so uh, there's those kind of aspects in there, definitely. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Andrew and uh, Tim. Okay, so my questions relate to the um, financial side of this. Um, and I'm interested in the assumptions that have been made in arriving at that um, $65 million headroom figure, um, particularly around any changes to timing of stadium. And I think I heard earlier that the assumption is that stadium would continue to be delivered as planned and, and according to, um, according to um, existing timing projections. Um, LGFA covenants... Um, is there any discussion going on at the moment and is there any view about how those LGFA covenants might change um, as a result of what all councils are facing as a result of um, COVID-19? And I'm also interested in any, ass any assumptions that may have been made around um, rating levels in arriving at that $65 million figure. So just a bit of further commentary around those aspects I think would be quite useful. Perhaps I could start making some comments and then I might invite um, Dawn to make some further comments. So I, I do need to say to you that at the moment we're in unprecedented times. Things are changing and evolving rapidly and um, there will be some decisions that will come to you as part of the annual plan process around timing of large projects and there will be options and scenarios for you to consider. At this point in time, the LGFA covenants, I'm not aware of um, any processes underway to change those, so I think we need to be considering those as, as a firm cap. And I perhaps might um, invite Dawn if she wants to make any further comments. Thank you, Carol, and thank you, Andrew. So it, it's really reiterating what I said earlier on, but maybe need to be a bit more explicit. We are now moving into a completely new world. So we are going to have to look at all of our projects that we borrow for, not just one or the other. So uh, in reality, we would be able, as a council, through annual plan and then into LTP, you would be looking at that with a fresh pair of eyes. My reflection to you as a council and your strategic aims, actually, this is a... Uh, a proposal that draws down government money, that provides housing to the people who are most vulnerable in society. It accesses resources we cannot access. And we are looking at other opportunities for future uh, ability to build, which doesn't go onto our balance sheet. And finally, it does not go onto the bottom line for us. So in some ways, it's a timing issue, I would say, Andrew, in the sense of we could have been doing this as part of the whole package of your choices around the capital programme. 
then I suspect you would probably want to do this. The point is the timing doesn't allow us, if I'm, if I'm right, Bruce. So we're here we are now, and we can't bring forward the capital debate until we work through all of the work we need to do together as governance and as the senior team. Uh, but we can make choices that enables us to make sure we've got the right comfort in the headroom moving forward, but we will need to do that with our elected members. Did you have anything else, Andrew? Um, just an answer as to the um, rating assumption that was made in arriving at the $65 million figure, the rate increase assumptions. Andrew, it's um, Carol here. Um, there were some assumptions made around that, but we also know that the COVID impacts um, for council are significant and that the impact of a potential, potential and likely reductions on the CCHL dividends will be significant. Yeah. So I think um, all of those assumptions are sort of up in the air at the moment, but what we do know is that there will be pressure on that headroom and that um, prudence and caution is required at this time. And as Dawn talked about, earlier wanting to look at the big picture of all your other capital projects and priorities. Yeah, no, I, I understand all of that, but the question remains, what assumption was made around rates increases in arriving at the $65 million figure? Or is the $65 million figure relevant anymore? Indeed. And I guess that's what I'm sort of signalling to you, that things are so fluid at the moment that um, the ability to keep headroom is actually probably the more important thing than what the actual figures are. All right, thank you. But there are, there are alternative means that you are all looking at as to whether another funding option can be created that this decision wouldn't stand in the way of, but would just simply transfer to if we agreed. Is that right? That, that's I'm, correct. I'm certainly um, not. Bruce <laughs> oh, yeah. Bruce. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's correct. Um, so we are looking at a, a financing mechanism that could be off balance sheet. But um, yeah. that will take some time to develop, and it's not a, a, a quick fix um, no. in an immediate need for well, immediate opportunity where there is government funding available now um, and potential demand to drive it forward. So, um, but we will still continue that work and uh, keep councillors informed of that work. Yeah. Uh, may I add that also add, yep. sorry, may I just add as well, I think my, my nervousness would be greater if it wasn't 25 million. We're not talking about a massive amount of money. That's not two or 300 million. Yeah, I mean, for, for most people, $25 million does feel like a massive amount of money. Um, and I, I mean, I know what you're saying, that in the, in the context of government guaranteeing the rental component, which actually gives the re return that's required to service the $25 million, it's not it's not significant in that regard. I mean, if we're going to be that far off the headroom required, <laughs> then we're going to be far off it regardless of 25 million is what you mean, rather than $25 million this isn't a massive amount of money because it is. Um, Absolutely. Anyway, I've, got Tim, I've got Tim and James, thanks. Thank you. I've got a, just a few questions with regards to um, housing New Zealand. I mean, we're not the only players in the in the, the game with regards to social housing. And if we look at um, a council's function, yes, we do have a responsibility without question with regards to social quality, but we also have to function, make sure we're running the city. So. Um, what are, does anyone know what the um, plan for the um, Housing New Zealand's growth for social housing in our city and the numbers are talking? Um, I think, Bruce, I think yeah, I can... Bruce, Bruce, Bruce mentioned that before when he referenced that there will be money in the HUD budget and HUD, sometimes it, we use those three-letter three acronyms um, like they're just uh, like everyone understands the language that we're speaking, but that's Housing and Urban Development. It's a new organisation that's taken over from um, Housing New Zealand, so if I could hand over to you, Bruce, to answer the question. Yeah. Um, in terms of specific numbers, I don't have that, but what I do understand and, and know from 
uh, discussions through the trust in the past, is that the government um, is interested in about 30% um, of the needs in, in Christchurch being met by the community sector. Um, and the, um, well, there are a number of players there. Uh, the player in the best position that we understand at the moment is OCHT. So um, within the public housing plan... Excuse uh, me, I'm sorry for interrupting, but whoever's got their microphone on, please turn it off when you're not speaking. Somebody's typing or doing something in the background and it's very distracting. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah. So, so within the public housing plan uh, that's been published, there's over 900 places for Christchurch uh, heading into, um, and I haven't got it in front of me, so I'm just again going on memory, 2024. Okay. Uh, so that would be looking for about 30% of those 900 being delivered by the community sector. Um, the, uh, the first lot of those has been um, been allocated to OCHT. This goes into the second lot of that um, and, and helps to meet that 300. So yes, um, uh, Housing New Zealand um, is playing its part, but it's also looking at the community sector playing its part and then council working um, in partnership effectively with the government and the community sector to meet this need. Um, with regards to the, the $30 million loan that was received for, to build 130 units, um, you mentioned before the $25 million to um, build the 85 units should be um, should take about 12 to 18 months to build those 85 units. How is the build project going with the 130 units? How many of those are yep. completed? What's the timeline, that type of thing? So there's four complexes um, that uh, were included in that. Um, first of those is complete and tenanted. Uh, the second was completed just immediately before the lockdown um, and has been unable to be tenanted uh, under level four. Um, I'll need to check, but I think that they are able to be tenanted under level three. The third uh, uh, complex is due for, well, well, was due for completion in June. Um, we'll get an a updated ETA on that from the trust shortly. And then the final one, which is the Brougham Street complex, uh, was due, um, I'm off the top of my head again without looking at the, the, the detail, I think, at, um, between January and June next year, but I can provide that information through. So they're um, either complete or under construction. Um, it's taken a bit more time for those ones because of um, financing agreement up front, um, and as part of that, that's where we did some of that exploration about commercial uh, financing as well, um, which um, ultimately proved unfruitful. This, if this was supported by councillors, it would be much quicker because the existing, uh, the loan documentation is already in place um, and uh, it will take um, a lot less time to get the loan documentation approved. And, and if we approve the 25 million now, the overall loan for, from council to the trust will be about 100 million, wouldn't it? Because at the moment we gave the we gave a five million dollar loan and a 40 uh, sorry five million dollar gift and a 45 million dollar loan to start. Then we've given the yep. 30 million, and this would be another 25 million. So overall, the debt or the the loan to council or the loan from to council will be around about $100 million. Is that right to the trust? Um, yes and no. And I, I, why I say the and no is when you look at the $45 million, that is a effectively an interest-free loan of property that will is only considered that it would need to be repaid back if uh, the trust went into liquidation, lost their community housing provider um, um, status um, and uh, a couple of other similar type um, requirements. It's not uh, a commercial loan um, in the same sense that the 30 million and if you approve, approve the 25 million, that is. It's a very, a very different beast. But it, it must be on our books somewhere, surely, and affect us. Uh, 
Yes, um, and we've had certainly given some reports back on that. Maybe, Len, do you want to give a quick summary of how that 45 is treated on a uh, Yes, it's, um, you would have recalled the large discussions we've had over the last 18 months regarding the 45 million. We do not treat the 45 million per se as the loan value anymore. We have effectively recognised at every financial year end a reduction in the value of that loan because of its inability to be recovered, if you recall. Um, that was supported by the work undertaken by Deloitte at the time that we agreed the $45 million loan. So therefore, we always take that impairment view of that loan. So um, the, really, the $55 million, if you agree, the 25 turns to be the, the full le extent of the borrowing that um, we have with, with OCHT. Um, the, the conditions around the 45 million are very, very specific compared to the development funding agreement that we have in place for the building of these new units. Um, just uh, on that note, OCHT do not record that um, amount as being a, a, a liability to the council. They treat it as equity. Although we, d we don't have any opinion on that, that shows how they treat that capitalisation um, originally. So our exposure um, in property and cash is 100 million, of which cash is the um, will end up being the major thing on our balance sheet. Uh, thank you for that. With regards to um, paying back, so if we approve this, then we've got uh, 55 million of hard cash borrowed from us. What's the um, estimation with regards to any kind of paying back of that loan because are we going to, to um, be looking in another 18 months or whatever another request for another for the next tranche of um, rebuilds or new builds for social housing? Uh, Tim, it's Len here again. Yep. The, um, what we, when we, each of these development proposals comes to us um, from OCHT through a model that they have developed with um, Deloitte's. And we sit down and critique that model and include in their repayment cycles. In the uh, development financing agreement that we have in place with OCHT, the repayments are specifically um, identified in a schedule based on the returns that they get under the 133% um, rental that they get from the Crown. So therefore, each time we do a proposal for, a, for one of these developments, we add it into this model, we determine when the cash is due, um, we include a specific set of requirements to repay. Um, and it, that's in addition to the interest which is paid um, quarterly um, or six monthly, depending on the type of borrowing, plus the margin that we receive on top of those, of those borrowing costs. Okay. Um, let's and, regard, and, and in terms sorry. of in terms of future proposals, um, there is the possibility. But as I've mentioned already, we are trying to explore ways of doing this without it being on uh, council's books, um, and that work will uh, continue. And our aim would be to try and do do this so that we get to a um, self-sustaining position, if that's what where council wishes to go, of um, meeting any growth in demand um, and any gifts that Council sets us, but trying to get to a position where it doesn't impact on um, Council's books um, as well as being rates neutral as it is already. Um, and I mean, I guess that was the original um, thought when we, we first discussed this some time ago was that it could become self-funding and that would be the ideal. I guess because we are in unprecedented times and we've got to th you know, think outside the box, so to speak, the government gave a huge amount of money to, to the Wellington area with regards to funding social housing. 
um, we missed out on that, sadly. But with regards to the, the $16 billion fund, which um, government has generously put in and quite sensibly put in to support the, the horizontal infrastructure industry, could we not approach them to say, is there a way forward with regards to funding for the building industry, and this would be a good um, cornerstone or backbone to that? Is that a, Tim, a possibility? Tim, we, we, we've said three times now that there okay. is there are different funding streams, and for social housing, this is the, the the Crown Infrastructure Partnership approach is not a funding stream. So it's not for social housing; it's for other housing um, projects that have public benefit. So um, it isn't for, um, and it's for unlocking the barriers that are stopping developments from proceeding quickly and being shovel ready, as the description has been. Uh, but that's been a moving feast, and um, you know, I, th I think we've tried to narrow back our focus in, in that regard. This is unfortunate, but what you've described and all of your questions asked um, perfectly validly as they have been, they have all um, highlighted the undermining um, element of all of this, and that is that we cannot transfer our social housing to Ototahi Community Housing Trust, which is what we would do if we could, um, because we cannot guarantee that should the trust fail at some time in the future, that their asset class will not be lost to the city. And if we could guarantee that, uh, then we would simply make the complete transfer and none of this would be a question at all because Ototahi Community Housing Trust could enter into relationships with their banks um, as they see fit. So they can't at the moment because of the guarantee requirements that the banks have and uh, we're the ones who hold that guaranteed position because we um, have to protect that asset class for the people of Christchurch. So. Uh, I mean, you're highlighting the frustration that all of us have um, with the model, which is an imperfect model, and nothing that we debate about today will actually create um, the perfect model because it's not available to us under the set of circumstances that we have now. We can't access the income-related rental subsidy. Otatahi Community Housing Trust can. That's why we originally set them up, but it's a much better model for delivering social housing um, and, and providing that wraparound support for our tenants. So, but I'm, I won't enter into the debate for, for, because I've said that, but I am going to mention Stephen McPate, but McPate, but McPake, who was um, my, my favourite um, mayoral candidate, uh, who texted me to say, got a letter from the Trust saying they can move in at level three. So that's a good um, answer. Uh, tenants can move in at level three. And actually, um, from uh, circumstances that I'm aware of uh, around the place, then um, there is advice going out saying that people can uh, transfer, you know, continue with property sales and um, moving at level three as well. As long as it's all managed safely and uh, social distancing is practiced, um, that means that at level three, uh, people will be able to start moving in. So that's great news. Um, and that came off the back of one of your questions, Tim. So that sparked a re reaction from Stephen McPake. So just looking down the camera saying, thank you, Stephen. What, thank you for watching in and thank you for caring so much about social housing. Cheers. Right, um, so um, would someone like to uh, move the recommendations that we have in front of us? Jake McClellan and seconded by Andrew Turner. So, um, oh, and I should acknowledge uh, James Daniels and I should acknowledge Mike and Sarah from uh, the previous debate too, that when questions are asked and answered, they, uh, they've been indicating to all of us that uh, their questions have been asked and answered. So that, that, and that's great. Good, good work, team. Right, so um, it's been moved and seconded, so I'll open it up for debate. Um, who would like to... Um, speak in the debate. I, I can't see everyone, so um, shall I just run through the list quickly? Yes, please. Okay, Jimmy Chen. Okay, thank you. Uh, just briefly, yes. Uh, I support the uh, staff recommendation because the, this uh, uh, recommendation is compliant with the uh, council's policy to go to the social housing and also no uh, actual uh, cost uh, to the uh, council or red payer. And also this one particular uh, the, after the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, lockdown, we can see the 
steal the, you know, quite a few uh, homeless and uh, vulnerable people. So this uh, kind of recommendation can meet the lowest uh, people's need. And uh, also the uh, the Otahahi uh, the Christchurch uh, Housing Trust, actually they are eligible to, you know, to apply for the government's the, uh, income related uh, uh, rent, the subsidies, but a moment council is not. So let's, in the beginning, like uh, uh, the mayor, you mentioned earlier, you know, so that's why we established uh, this one. So council can continue to kind of uh, the working together with them. However, in the long term, we still consider whether the council or council own the organization also, you know, to continue to engage with the uh, kind of the, uh, the government, you know, whether we are eligible to seek in the IRRS on our own. Because if that becomes the happen, then council can fully control you know, all the council on the organization, also can achieve all the best the, the, the strategic outcome. So, but generally speaking, I support the staff recommendation. Thank you. Uh, Catherine Chu. Uh, no debate from me. Thanks, Leanne. Thank you. Melanie Coker. Um, thanks, um, Leanne. Um, it's probably no surprise um, I'd be um, supporting this, um, and I'm going to repeat a lot of what people have said, but um, as, as we've mentioned about unlocking the government funding that we can't access, I think it's important um, to prevent the barriers to building social housing. Um, and of course it supports um, the construction sector, sector getting back into um, action after um, this COVID-19 event um, and social housing or housing itself is a basic, um, you know, it's a human right and Christchurch City Council has a long history of supporting it so um, it, we need to remember that it doesn't impact um, on rates and the effect on the headroom we've been talking about really depends on what happens with our discussions and in later decisions around the long term um, plan um, because really um, in a way this sort of started for me to become a um, stadium versus social housing um, thinking because um, it is the stadium that will have the greatest greatest effect on our headroom, um, not this loan. So um, we need to keep that in mind. Um, I am, um, and we need, the other thing is that it was mentioned there's a waiting list for social housing so um, we really need to be protecting the most vulnerable people. But um, I am concerned about the cost per square metre because it does seem quite expensive um, to me so I would hope um, that that's being looked at um, for future or to see if we can actually get more houses out of it. Um, but the sooner that this is built, um, the sooner the trust can um, make an income from their housing um, to get the tenants in there and um, then they can maintain the housing stock that they've got and support the tenants who um, this is all for. Thank you. Oh, Pauline? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, look, I think Melanie's spoken very well, um, so I'm not going to say anything particularly, except that I do support this, and we do have a considerable number of units to catch up just to get back to pre-quake levels, and this is one way to do it. That's me. Thank you. Oh, sorry, James Daniels. Kia ora. Uh, look, I'll be quick too. I... I I think this is a fantastic opportunity to use our heft as a council to support the citizens through the uh, Otatahi Community Housing Trust with no cost to ratepayers and no risk bringing economic activity to the city as well. So I will be supporting it. Kia ora. Thanks for the report. Really good uh, paper, by the way. Kia ora. Thank you. Uh, Mike Davidson. Thank you. Yeah, look, I guess I'm going to echo the comments of the, the three before me. Um, you know, we've done in front of right now that's going to help you know, some of the most vulnerable in society. Um, and in a post-COVID world, the well-being of our people needs to be at utmost importance to us. Um, and we know this decision is not going to impact rates, and it's not, and it's actually going to unlock government money. Um, so I think the main question has been around our comfort around the debt headroom. Um, and of course, I, I'm assuming we'll hear from a few councillors that will argue that we should just stick to our knitting. 
Um, but I, I guess that, you know, as we, we move forward, if we are concerned about our um, debt headroom, then we need to have a conversation about the stadium. Um, and that's the same with sticking to our knitting. Once again, we'd need to have a conversation with our stadium. So I'm happy to support this item. Uh, Anne Galloway. Yeah, kia ora. yeah, I'm uh, totally in support and appreciate all the comments that have been made. And as Mike has said, um, uh, you know, the statement stick to our knitting. I think actually this is our knitting because we have a clear policy that uh, we will support social housing. I think it's difficult um, to be able to quantify the economic benefit of being able to, uh, to, put, to have people in homes, stable environments where they can actually leave to go to work, hold down a job, the uh, economic benefits of having children who are in a stable home uh, can go to the same school and live in a community where they are known and uh, they feel um, safe. Those sorts of things are very difficult to quantify, but they are all very much part of this picture, and it's absolutely the right thing to do at the moment. We are probably facing a very difficult future for many people, and this is the time to signal that we are going to be caring for people going forward. In the 1930s, I think the government um, did uh, a lot of work on building social housing to provide employment and also um, to um, provide uh, infrastructure, and I think that um, this is another time like that, so absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, James Goff. Thanks. Look, it, it may be rates neutral, but it obviously increases our borrowing considerably, which considerably decreases our headroom. So I think you know we can't fool ourselves that there isn't an opportunity cost here with this. Um, that being said, um, the expressions come up you know, is this our knitting? And I think fundamentally that that's the question that, that we're all going to have to ask. I think one thing that we need to be acutely aware of is no one knows where this is going to end up. And when I say this, I mean the outlook for Christchurch, for New Zealand, uh, globally as much as nationally and locally. So I think the one thing that we can be certain of is that the unexpected will arise and I think that it is incredibly important, if not our duty, to be prepared for that as best we can. So I'm aware that we have a policy to grow our social housing, um, but frankly, I disagree with that because I think that that makes about as much sense as saying that we have uh, an aspiration or a policy to strive to increase the amount of people on the unemployment benefit. So my preference would be to improve what we do have because I think the quality of people's lives across the board is terribly important. Uh, but almost more importantly, create pathways for people to be able to get out of social housing. So on balance for me, I don't think this is the time to be supporting this and I will not be supporting the recommendations. Thank you. Aaron? Um, well, uh, it is a big debate. Um, I uh, am... Oddly, I am in favour of um, social housing because of the security it does um, afford people who, uh, for whatever reason, need help and support for a time in their life. Um, I am very, very concerned about our debt headroom uh, as a council. There will be something else around the corner. Um, a, a lot of it falls back on the government right now to how quickly uh, New Zealand will recover out of um, this financial uh, hit. Uh, for me, jobs are incredibly important, um, and that's why it's interesting that the stadium gets pulled into the debate here because uh, the stadium is jobs, not just in the building of it, but then the servicing of it and the events that go on and so on and so forth. There's a, there's a knock-on effect. Um, I don't think it's healthy for it to become about social housing versus, uh, versus a stadium. They're two completely different beasts. Um, and uh, there's a lot of people in our city that don't believe we should have a stadium, just as there's a lot of people who don't believe the council should be involved in social housing. That is a government responsibility. So both views do exist. We are here to represent both. Um, this is a good deal. Uh, it's not the council's knitting, it's the trust's knitting, and uh, they will deliver on some quality uh, social housing. Uh, so to that end, um, I'm okay that the deal happens. But we have some, we do have some big debates coming up. If councillors are willing to throw things on the table like the uh, stadium, 
then everything's on the table going forward. And if we were a smart council, we'd all be in the same room. We'd be in the same room this coming week. And we would look at every single item that we have that does not have a contract already gone out for it. And we would be starting to go, what can be pushed out? What can wait? How important is every single item in our budget? And the sooner we get in that room and start having that discussion, the sooner the people in this city can sleep at night, including those in social houses. Thank you. Uh, Sam McDonald? Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's probably no surprise then around the table that I have a fundamental belief that social housing uh, is not a local government responsibility, and in fact, a central government one. Um, but that's actually not the debate for today, you know, to, to be blunt. We, um, the, the challenge I have with this is around um, uh, the premise that we should grow social housing as a council. And um, I agree entirely with what Jamie said that uh, actually, you know, this commercially is a good deal. Um, but I think at the moment our headroom is so close and we have so many challenges, I, I just can't see that we would be, be responsible on behalf of the ratepayers at the moment. So look, I think uh, there is a time and place. I'm fundamentally uh, lightly and frustrated, I think, with the arrangement that exists between the Housing Trust and the Council. Uh, and I think we do need to look at a mechanism to do that. Uh, but I think if we're going to be really honest, uh, we need to really manage um, that debt room for the Council. And you know, there's been commentary around the assumptions of, uh, which drive that headroom around rates. Um, you know, in the environment we're in now, uh, let's get really real. Uh, whether it's a 2% rate rise or 0% rate rise, that headroom is still significantly changed in the COVID environment. Um, so I think we do need to be really upfront with the ratepayers that, uh, you know, we have significant debt as a council. Uh, do we want to leverage that any further? And at the moment, I don't think we're in a position uh, to do that without uh, a lot more information in terms of the annual plan and the long-term plan. Uh, so I, I can't support it. I'm, I'm sorry, but somebody has got their microphone on. It sounds like you're having your lunch. Um, who, who, can you just turn off your microphone if you're not speaking, please? Thank you very much, whoever it was. Um, Jake McClellan. It might be me, um, Mia, but it's not me having my lunch. It's my noisy flatmates. Hey, um, I just wanted to say that it's important in these unprecedented times that we don't forget about the most vulnerable in society especially as we can expect this group to grow. Um, there's a prudence in doing this, and I guess I would just encourage my colleagues to um, to have a heart. Thank you. Um, uh, Tim Scandrit. Um, thank you a lot, and it's been a really interesting debate. Um, the comment with regards to growing social um, housing, I think perhaps that's another debate that we should have to get that one out and, and sorted. So we can, and there'll just be a numbers around the table to see if we um, continue with that um, aspiration because we've been doing it, I think, since 1932 or something. So I think it's been pretty well established. Whether we continue that or not, I think that's a debate around the table which should be had to just put it to bed. Um, I met some time ago on my campaigning the council um, staff member who was getting the funding for social housing way back in the day and he said to me, because I did question about the quality of the builds and he said oh, they were built to building standards so we were just after as much money as possible. And when you look at the old Brougham Street um, buildings which are ice boxes in winter and sweat boxes in summer and leaked all the time, um, to hear that um, the Housing Trust is actually getting it right and building to six star I think is absolutely outstanding because our three star is actually 20th century building. I think that's uh, to the standard of Great Britain in 1999. So it's actually pretty rubbish, to be quite honest, three star. Um, but the difference between three star and six star is less than 3%, and that's from our own um, building staff. So I, I do think we've got to always question the square meterage and I think that's been mentioned by a couple of people. I am in a quandary because our headroom is really, really um, of a concern and there will be things that are, that are going to be thrown at us through this current situation. When we talk about the most vulnerable, I think we're forgetting that there are groups of people in our community and our society that have never been vulnerable before and suddenly the finance companies are hitting them or um, people have, uh, uh, I think someone made the comment once, they've never seen so many Ford Rangers going to be repossessed. So I think there are some new vulnerable people that we've really got to start con uh, having a concern and they will approach us at some stage. So I am 
I would have started this debate looking at this thinking I would um, abstain. I will support this because I think the Housing Trust has to get to a position where they are self-funding and um, stop on these loans and we can, they can only get there by us supporting them. So I will be supporting this today but I do have concerns with regards to our headroom. The, I really am disappointed that the stadium is being mentioned because that is actually about positive economic benefit, true positive economic benefit. Dunedin are very clever with theirs and they keep it to themselves and well done. Um, I think there'd be a very different community down there if they did not have a roofed stadium. Um, and, and employment is huge with uh, around these things. Um, yeah, real shame, but I, I will be supporting this today. Thank you. Sarah. Kia ora, thank you. Um, I think one of the great things about this proposal is that even especially at this time it supports both our most vulnerable residents and also supports a whole pile of um, businesses, contractors who um, are looking for work in this, uh, you know, the, the residential has been going down um, post-quake after the, after the highs and to continue with those residential building programs is really important especially now when we're looking for that economic activity. Um, Growing social housing at the moment, this particular one, isn't about council building. This is about us um, enabling other people to do their knitting. So it's the housing. This is an us enabling the housing trust to build more social housing and growing it for the city, not necessarily growing it for council. Um, while we could only concentrate potentially on upgrading our existing social housing which in many cases is not fit for purpose. It's really clear that that's not enough because some of those are just not suitable, they're not economic to upgrade and so being able to replace those over time is also going to be really important. And while it's true that we don't know exactly what is going to happen with this crisis and after this crisis, um, one thing that we do know for certain is that we have an ageing population and one of the key things that this does is build those, um, those single and two bed units that are designed for our older population as they get older and more vulnerable. Uh, and so that's why this is such an important paper today. Thank you. Andrew Turner. Thank you. Um, the starting point for this debate, re and the factual starting point in fact for this debate, is that our policy position and our strategic direction is to support and to grow social housing. For me this is about priorities and a quality and sufficient quantity of warm, dry, fit for purpose homes for those that need the most, leading to community well-being and community resilience. Um, is and should be a high priority, particularly now. My understanding is that there's currently a waiting list of between 400 and 800 people who would benefit from social housing in Christchurch and in particular would benefit from additional social housing in Christchurch, which is what this is about. I'm definitely in favour of looking into a CCO model through CCHL as a vehicle to further invest in social housing, but we've heard in answers to questions that that isn't something we could expect to do quickly, something that we certainly should pursue, but it will take time. We've got this opportunity in front of us today. It's also worth reflecting on the environment that we're working in as regards government policy around funding support via the IRS and the funding mechanisms that are described in the paper that's in front of us today. Again, you know, that's the environment we're in. Those are the opportunities. Um, so what we have in front of us here is not only a mechanism to build much needed additional social housing, but also a mechanism to get people back into jobs. Um, housing typically is an opportunity for smaller and more local building contractors um, and also subcontractors rather than the larger construction companies that are typically involved in roading or three waters, bigger civil engineering type projects. So I think there's an opportunity for local work here as well. Um, it's also an opportunity to unlock central government funding, which is available. Um, this is an opportunity that we should be taking while it exists. So this is an example of where we can support the trust to be doing work which is aligned with our overall strategy and it's work that we couldn't do ourselves. The trust's well placed to do it. They're ready to go. We just need to make the right decision today. There is no risk to ratepayers. We've got the GSA over the trust property that provides first ranking security over those assets. Um, the only issue, as we've heard, is the, the debt headroom piece and that is a concern but we've also heard that there are other moving parts around that which 
we will have more certainty and we which will which we will consider as we look at capital program and other priorities through the annual plan and long term plan and there are other projects other big projects that we can consider the timing and delivery of as as a part of that strategic directions have been mentioned um risk and resilience certainly are a big focus of this council and having sufficient and suitable housing is a big part of creating community resilience and reducing risk risk around well-being and health outcomes in our communities but in addition to that we're going to need to look at the future through a covid-19 recovery lens as well um and a big part of that is social and economic recovery um and here we've got the opportunity to create a significant economic benefit of getting people in work keeping people in jobs keeping construction businesses in business at a time when there are going to be some big challenges um and for me that's certainly a big consideration here as well as the the housing outcomes so i support this it's an opportunity for us to make a decision to get something moving which is going to have significant social and economic benefit without any risk to rate payers so absolutely support this today Thank you very much. And uh, just can I just compliment people on the quality of the debate? I think uh, people have focused on on the issues. I think there are a couple of things that have come up that perhaps aren't so much relevant to this debate, but will be relevant to debates that we'll have in the future. Um, I think the key, though, for me, and and I guess I'm communicating to uh, a wider audience, but particularly to the chief executive and the staff of the organisation. we must find out come up with a sustainable funding solution that resolves this problem uh i'm i'm in favor of this because i know that it unlocks government money now and that is absolutely core critical to getting anything done in this space um anywhere in the country let alone here in Christchurch and so it's vitally important that we're able to unlock the door for OCHT to do the job that it's proving itself very capable of doing uh but we do need to get to a stage as soon as possible because um we know that there are um there are headwinds ahead and we also know that our headroom is limited so um in order to ensure that OCHT can get ahead in the meantime uh but also um accept the responsibility of us as councillors to take a, a a prudent approach to managing our finances and maintaining sufficient headroom uh i keep reminding people that because one risk that we had on our risk register has materialized it doesn't reduce the risk of any of the other risks on our risk register materializing any time now we could have a massive earthquake um any time now and uh we could have uh, a fire we could have floods we could have all of the um events tidal waves we know what those events um are we know what we monitor the risk around those uh and we are leaving ourselves um at risk in an environment where we can actually do something about it and what we can do about it is to make sure that the um sustainable funding option for the for the growth of social housing sits with um OCHT and completely off our balance sheet altogether which will enable the work to continue at pace uh which is what i support So um I will ask you Joe to put the motion. Thank you. Okay. Mia? Aye. Councillor Turner? Aye. Councillor Chen? Aye. Councillor Chu? No. Councillor Koka? Yes. Councillor Cotter? Aye. Councillor Daniels? <laughs> Councillor Davidson? Aye. Councillor Galloway? Yes. Councillor Goff? No. Councillor Kewen? No. Councillor McDonald? No. Councillor McLellan? Aye. Councillor Scandrett? Aye. Councillor Templeton? Aye. 
It's 11 votes for the motion and four votes against. Thank you. That's uh, declared carried.